for life. Right. Welcome to the 13th COVID-313 Community Coalition for Families and Students Teletown Hall. Again, I'm Christine Bell, mother of three amazing children, honored to serve as the Executive Director of Urban Neighborhood Initiatives, proud member of this coalition, and today's co-moderator. We have an exciting schedule to today. We're gonna to talk about summer school uh, and summer program how we keep ourselves healthy while we reopen. And we're gonna deep dive into what it means when people say they want the police defunded. Cindy, please share the phone number for Spanish translation. Si necesitas traducción en español, por favor habla al 626-7440-313, 626-7440. Hoy la traducción sería por la señora Gloria Rosas y Cristina Ruiz Mason. Thank you, Cindy. Saeed, please share the phone number for Arabic translation. In kunta bihajat in litarjamati il logati la rabia, a rajal, the sala la rakum, tleti wahatleti, nen arbawahat, saba sifur, tleti sifur, a rakum hua tleti wahatleti, nen arbawahat, saba sifur, tleti sifur, makum Saeed, wanajwa dahda, wanahum stadun lichidmat. Thank you. Thank you, Saeed. Julie, mm -hmm. please share the instructions for ASL. Thank you, Julie. We want to hear from you. Please chat your comments or questions on Facebook or text them to 313-288-2082. Again, that number is 313-288-2082. To get us started today, please welcome the powerful and inspiring Arlisa Hurd. Arlisa? Introduction. So thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Again, my name is Arlisa Hurd. I am a mother of two sons. I'm a first time grandmother, member of 42 Forward, and of course, a member of this wonderful coalition and a resident in the Hope Village neighborhood, which is Focus Hope. Um, as these days have turned into weeks and weeks into months, I am sure there are many stories, many testimonies, and many experiences that we would have never thought we would that would be ours to tell in 2020. Can you believe it? It is already June. The year is half gone. So we are here. We are here in this moment. We're witnessing transition. We are changing. We are shifting from one state to another. It seems all of the nations are calling for change in this moment and many key leaders are rising to the occasion and it's all happening now. But what's also happening is things are coming alive again or coming back to life. Places are opening up, folks are planning for their summers. We see more people in the park, schools are laying out their plans to return personal services, clothing stores, dining restaurants, everything's opening up. And in fact, some folks are even, I've even seen people standing in line to get in some of these places. But even as some of these restrictions are being relaxed and things are opening, we still have the responsibility to be safe. We still have a responsibility to ensure that we're holding systems accountable and you have a responsibility to take care of you. I know it's been annoying to sanitize things in the home two, three times a day, the frequent hand washing, making sure to stay six feet away from everyone else. But because we've done that, because you have done that, that is what has helped us to keep ourselves and our family safe. So please don't give up. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't stop. Let's still keep ourselves safe and enjoy being able to shop and Get that manicure again. And after you have safely dined in and shopped for yourself and the kids and treated yourself to a nice manicure or a much needed haircut, please remember we are still in the fight for justice. We're still in the fight for equity and the liberation of all black and brown bodies, past and present, that have been oppressed by a system of racism. So that's it for me. 
Now let's bring on Cindy Gamboa. Cindy. Thank you, Arlisa. It's a hard act to follow. Um, hi, everyone. I am Cindy Gamboa. I am a mother of three beautiful children, and I'm honored to serve as the Director of Community Organizing at De uh, Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation. I'm glad to be back with you all today. Um, and I wanted to start by asking you, how are you today? Have you slowed down and checked in with yourself? How are you feeling? Have you ever had a fluttering feeling in your stomach, a racing heartbeat, or a feeling that something just ain't right? Even though you try to shake it and tell yourself a million reasons why everything is fine, you feel that it just isn't? Well, that premonition is probably guided by your intuition. We all have it. The problem, however, is that it's not always easy to trust our intuition. The impulse to act is often guided by what we're used to doing, um, what we were taught to do, and maybe even what we see other people doing. Naturally, we're social beings. And with the weather being so nice outside, psh, social distancing? Hold on, that's not critical anymore, is it? Actually, it is. Um, I've been invited to a lot of birthday parties and carne asada cookouts lately. And I've been so close to just grabbing those car keys and my cell phone running out the door. But there's a little part of me that nags at me and says, hold on. I know that's my intuition. I forced myself to pause and think of the risk that that can bring to my family, my friends, and people that I love if I were just to resume life as usual. And that's helped me pass up a lot, of, a lot of things. Now, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of gatherings that I would have loved to be at, but it comforts me knowing that my family and those around me are safe and healthy. We're not out of the woods yet, my people, so please continue to use your judgment, follow your intuition, and stay safe. Now, before I turn it over to my colleague, I wanted to pause and I wanted to celebrate the moment that we're in right now. We've had two major Supreme Court wins recently. We won the protection to LGBTQ plus community and their civil rights protection. That means that we finally have protections against discrimination in the workplace for our LGBTQ uh, brothers and sisters. And today, we won DACA not to be rescinded. That means that over 800,000 dreamers can continue to live and work in the United States without the daily fear of deportation. Now, these accomplishments are huge, and they were accomplished because of the power being generated right now in our communities because of black people, because of young people, because of the relentless advocates, because of all of you out there that are fighting for the rights of us all. I wanted to say thank you and keep fighting for permanent solutions that are gonna protect our entire community. Thank you. Pass it over to Christine. Thank you, Cindy. Every time we talk about what we've won in this week, it brings such uh, great joy and tears because uh, this has been such a difficult time. Um, and but these two wins are are huge for for our people. So thank you, thank you for sharing that. So, but also caring for others, we also have to care for ourselves. And part of caring for ourselves means that we have to educate ourselves about what we can do um, in this moment and, and with our kids. It's been a long quarantine, that is for sure. And as parents, we need to be able to figure out how we find joy for ourselves and for our, for our kids while keeping ourselves safe. There are things we can do like play outside with our kids or let them play outside, take a bike ride or just play in the front yard. We all know there are a lot of emotions and real fears right now. 
There are real things as parents we have to worry about related to COVID. As parents, we need to be here for each other. We need to work together to make sure we have the best information to make the best decisions for our families and for ourselves. I know the root of our fears and worries are about keeping our families and ourselves safe. Today, we want to remind you that we're in this together and we're going to work our hardest to get the best information in your hands as we fight through COVID and we fight through the injustices that we've experienced um, over decades and decades. So Cindy, can you please share the Spanish translation number one more time? Si necesita traducción en español, por favor, habla al 313-626-7440, 313-626-7440. Thank you, Cindy. Saeed, please share the number for Arabic translation. En kunta bihajatin li tarjamati ila lughati al-arabiya, al-raja al-utisal ala rakam 313-241-7030, 313-241-7030. Thank you, Saeed. Julie, please share the instructions for ASL for folks that just arrived. Thank you, Julie, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jametta Lilly, and I am a proud Detroiter. I'm a mom, and I am dubbed Queen Nana by awesome grandchildren. I'm also proud to say that I am one of those women from Michigan. I'm also blessed to be the CEO of the Detroit Parent Network, where we work hard to make sure that parents are educated, equipped and empowered for taking care of their children, being champions for children and being champions for change. Change, change that is our operative word right now because we are witnessing change at an unprecedented time in our nation. As our speakers said before, we've had lots of wins and those wins have come through our determination, our persistence in keeping our eyes focused on the long prize ahead, which is to have an anti-racist society and that we're all working together for justice. But as we're working for justice and we're working for change, I must echo the same. Please family, stay safe. Wear your mask. Keep that social distancing. We don't want to be the new Florida or the new Arizona. All of us and our Michigan leadership has worked hard to make us crush the curb, save more lives. Be with us in this unique fight. Yes, protest. Yes, collectively work. Yes, move forward. But let's do it safely because we have a challenge that only our behavior can help mitigate. So with that, as we talk about behavior and power and collective action, I'm so delighted again to let you know we have a wonderful program for you over the next hour and a half. You'll have an opportunity to hear from our experts and ask your questions. So we'd like to let you know you can ask questions in the Facebook chat or you can text us at 313-288-2082. That text number again is 313-288-2082. We're going to have Q&A after almost every segment. So get ready. Uh, we'll pause to make sure that we hear from you. Also, uh, our guests that are joining us as experts, please slow down while you're speaking so our translators can make sure they capture all of your important statements. When you come on, please turn off your camera when you're not speaking as well as your mic so it doesn't interfere. Terry Whitfield is our super timekeeper and he's gonna let you know speakers about when you have another minute or two left in your presentation. And if Terry doesn't catch your attention, then I'll try to gently remind you that we need to move forward in our program. So again, if you're just joining us, Welcome to the COVID-313 Community Coalition for our families and our youth. And this is our now 13th town hall. If you'd like to text us, uh, you can send it to 313-288-2082 or also use the Facebook chat. So now we'll move into our section as we do all the time to bring you facts, resources, and support. 
because Lord knows we all need support at this challenging time. And who do we turn to in cases like this? We have to turn to our health officials. So we're very pleased to welcome new to the program is Naveen Elder. Naveen is a communication specialist with our Detroit Health Department. Welcome, Naveen. Hello, everyone. Hope you guys can hear me and you can all see me as well. If I'm going too fast, please feel free to stop me. But thank you. I'm excited to be sharing the stage with some phenomenal people. And I totally echo a lot of the thoughts that were said um, before. So I just want to go ahead and provide you with some brief updates from the health department. Uh, the first slide, if we can go there, please. Thank you. Just wanted to provide you all with some numbers on the current situation in Detroit right now. So as of today, we have 11,000 332 confirmed cases. Um, below that, we also have a graphic showing the breakdown according to race. And we see that predominantly of the cases have been from the Black and African uh, American community within Detroit. Uh, aside from that, we also wanted to show you the amount of deaths that have also been occurring, which is 1,424 confirmed deaths in the city. Um, and again, we also have the breakdown predominantly of which have been from the Black and African American uh, race as well. But as we move forward to the next slide, we also want to show you the breakdown according to the zip code and the district. And so from this graphic, what you can see is that the darker colored regions are the regions that have had higher cases of COVID. And so when we look at it, we see on towards the left side uh, between districts one, two, and seven, that those have had higher rates. Now, I don't want this to alarm you just because of things that were echoed before in that Michigan has done a phenomenal job of trying to keep Michigan safe. Uh, leadership has done a great job and we've seen a flattening in the curve. And what we need to do is to continue our efforts, continue our preventative measures that we're taking in order to reduce our chances of seeing a second wave. And as we move to the next slide, uh, you know, if you, I know that uh, a lot of this is, is being said, but every single person has a role to play. We all have a responsibility for ourselves and our communities, uh, and we need to make sure that we're doing what's necessary in order to protect everyone. So therefore, it's essential that we all take the preventative measures so that we can slow the spread of this virus and we can just try to get back to our, our normal routine as soon as we can. So I know that, again, this may not be new information, but just some, some basic tips on what to do if you do feel you're experiencing symptoms. The first of which is just to stay home. Make sure you're not by anyone. Uh, you know, take care of yourself and watch out for yourself. And if you find that things are getting a bit worse, then, be, then feel free to call your physician um, and try to get some medical advice. And don't show up to the visit just yet if you're going and do not use public transportation. Um, and if symptoms become so severe that you need to see a medical professional immediately, then feel free, then, well, you should definitely go and seek medical attention, emergent medical attention. And on the next slide, what we wanted to do is also cover the same ways that we've all been hearing about these buzzwords uh, in, in our day-to-day -day lives now is, so for your hand washing, please make sure that you're still washing your hands very frequently for at least 20 seconds. If you don't have soap and water, then feel free to use hand sanitizer that has at least 60% um, alcohol in it, in it. Be sure to wear a cloth mask if you decide to go out in public. And the CDC recommends a cloth mask. You don't need those ones that medical professionals wear, um, but just be sure that you, are, that you are wearing one when you go out. And when you do go out, maintain that six feet distance between you and others. Now, some things that we shouldn't be doing during all of this is touching your eyes, nose, or mouth when your hands have not been washed thoroughly. In addition, don't pull your mask down when talking to other people. Uh, I know that sometimes it can be hard to breathe and we're not used to it, it's uncomfortable, but it's most effective when it's covering uh, your nose and your mouth. So once you put it on, please don't take it off. And then also, if you or someone else is sick, please be sure to keep your distance from one another. And hopefully these are, me these are measures we could take to protect um, yourself and others as well. So I know that the news um, has had some things about COVID in children, and thankfully COVID seems to be much less dangerous in children than in adults. But from what you've seen is that some, there may be a rash that's potentially associated with COVID-19. 
And it's important that parents are aware of this and concerned, but not something to be alarmed about. If you look on the right-hand side within the green bar, there are, some certain, there are symptoms there. And if you find that your child or a child has had these symptoms, then be sure to contact a medical provider and be able to see them um, to get treated for that. So we also want to provide you with some updates on where you can get free COVID testing. Um, this, this testing is available to all Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb uh, County residents. And in order to schedule an appointment, you just have to call the number below and be and have a have some form of ID with you as you go. But again, this is appointment only, so be sure to call first. And on the next slide, we also have um, testing here at the Detroit Health Department. This is a bit more limited. So this testing is only available to those who are Detroit restaurant, um, if you work in a restaurant, a bar, salon, or barbershop in Detroit, or you're an individual contractor within the city as well. And so you can feel free to give us a call and schedule an appointment and you show up. Um, and the cost for both this testing at the Detroit Health Department, as well as the previous slide uh, is at the State Fairgrounds are both free. Just be sure to schedule an appointment beforehand. And here are just some resources for you all in case you would like some more information. The Detroit Health Department is right in your backyard, so please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, we have a phone number, an email, our website, and then also community resources as well. Um, for some of the most up-to-date information on COVID-19, you can look at the CDC or the World Health Organization, which is the WHO. We also have some behavioral health resources as well. Um, here's a, a slew of them for you here. And if you feel that you would like some, some help, then you're more than welcome to reach out to any of these resources that we have listed here. And if these slides, um, I don't know if we can make them available to everyone, but um, you know, feel free to, to reach out. And then we have another slide with additional resources. Sorry, a lot of them today. Um, COVID-19, it's a big, big topic and so there's a lot to understand about it. So we have some designated resources um, from the internet for adults and some that are more tailored towards kids. I know that it can be a lot to understand. So hopefully the, this can ease the, the process of really absorbing all of that information. And that is all that I have for you today. So thank you very much. Naveen, and thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful and very thorough update. Um, we encourage those to please look in our chat and we're gonna be making all of the slides available. So thank you for putting that together for us. Christine, do we have any questions for Naveen uh, from that uh, very excellent uh, presentation? We do, we do. And remember there's a survey that's in the chat right now um, for you to give us your feedback. So please, um, go ahead and fill that out. And if you fill it out, you'll be put in a raffle to win a $25 gift card. Thank you so much. This was such a great presentation. So we've heard that tests aren't always accurate. What does the department recommend for folks who are returning to work? That's a great question. So there is, uh, you know, there are of course accurate accuracy issues, but that's gonna be widespread through a lot of tests that we do day to day. Um, it is important to get a test if you feel, if you're one, if you're concerned about going back to work and you think you may have been exposed. Um, and if you're working with people, it's probably best that you that you also get a test. I also have uh, Miss Yolanda Hill Ashford here as well, who's the director of health promotion. And so if she feels that there's something I'm missing, she might just jump right up uh, uh, on here as well. Um, nope. Good. Great answer. Um, I would encourage everybody, though, that if they have tested and feel like something wasn't well, something was amiss to um, they should likely uh, either isolate if they're feeling any symptoms or uh, consult their physician uh, via telework or um, a visit. I mean, telehealth or visit. Great. Thank you. A few more here. I've heard that uh, one of the symptoms is losing uh, taste or smell. Can you tell us more about that? So that's a good question. I'm not a medical provider, so I don't know the exact specifics. From what we know is that some people may experience that as a symptom. And once people have recovered from COVID, 
they might still experience those symptoms. Um, in terms of how it actually happens, I'm not quite sure, but there may be resources um, on the CDC that can definitely help you look into that further. We will definitely look into that and, and get, get more information out to the folks that ask that question. Um, okay, so what should I do if I go to, into a retail store? That's a great question. And so a lot of the a lot of measures that are being taken um, is that people are requiring uh, uh, consumers to actually wear masks. So they might even take your temperature check right at the door when you walk in as well. And they might do a quick screening asking you if you've had any of the symptoms relating to COVID. And so um, if you, some of them are also limiting how many people can be at the store at one time. So just be mindful of all of that. It's things that we're doing already, you know, monitoring your symptoms if you do, just, if you do have any. If you do, best to stay home. Um, wear a mask when you go in. Be careful to touch, you know, be careful of, and be mindful of what you're touching out there and be sure to have some hand sanitizer ready, which a lot of the stores already do. So it is safe, just follow the typical precautions that we are um, encouraging, social distancing, uh, washing your hands, sanitizing, and also keeping that mask on at all times. So two more questions. Is it safe to start taking children into the grocery store or should we continue to limit their outings and then is it also safe to take kids outside? It's a good question. So I'll answer the outside one just because that's a bit easier. Outside, absolutely. Kids can go get fresh air. They need fresh air. We all do. Um, so definitely spend the time outside. But just, again, be mindful of where you're at. Um, you know, if you don't, we wouldn't recommend going to the playground just because there's a lot of, you know, there's when people are touching the equipments and whatnot. So we want to stay away from those, but going on a going on a walk, riding your bike, taking a hike somewhere, those are all safe. And of course, just keep following your, your safety protocols. In terms of the grocery store, um, I'm not sure what the clinical opinion is, but in order to avoid large crowds, maybe it's not best. Um, especially if you have young children, it's not recommended to put a mask on them if they're two or younger. Um, so if you can keep them away from the grocery store, it may be better just to limit their own exposure. Great. Thank you. So this one is related to haircuts. One, is it safe to get a haircut? And, and you know, many of us are itching to get our haircuts. Um, and what, uh, what should I do when I get my haircut? So it sounds like this person is going to get their haircut. And what should yeah. do? No, what I don't blame you. And what should you do? Yeah, we're all thinking it, right? Someone just yeah. had to ask the question. <laughs> so again, just try to make sure that you are taking those safety precautions. Um, you know, be sure to check if you have any symptoms. If you have a, if you're having a fever, please stay away and don't and don't enter. Um, I'm not sure, and I'm sorry, I should have looked up more on the precautions of what should happen if you go get a haircut. Um, but we, the good thing is that Detroit is right now testing barbershops and salon employees in Detroit and so for COVID testing. And so hopefully that can minimize risk. Um, but of course, it's just the, the same procedures that we've been putting out there, masks, um, social distancing a little hard for your hair, um, but we're doing what we, what we can. I'm sorry, I, I don't know if that's a complete answer for you or not. So um, it, people are really missing their, um, their grooming <laughs> rituals. <laughs> Uh, so somebody also asked about um, eyebrows, but I would assume that that is similar. You can't do yeah. the social distancing, so you should really have the mask and and if you have yeah. Symptoms, yeah. But a check for also people who are going into these places is check and see if they're actually sanitizing before and after every client. Um, are they checking in with? Are they doing maybe a little screening? That's that's helpful. Do they have hand sanitizer hand sanitizer available or a hand washing station? And if they don't, then maybe that may that may not be the best place for you to go um, and get your hair cut or or freshen up. So just uh, some food for thought on that. Okay, so th that's actually I think really wonderful advice that we should also be mindful. It's not just what we're doing, but mindful of what the businesses might be doing to, to help to keep us safe as well. So thank you for that. Um, you had mentioned early in your presentation, if you're sick um, and you know you need to stay home and, and um, so on and so forth. So what if you live with 
more than one person. Do you have any recommendations of how to keep the rest of your family safe and healthy if someone falls ill of COVID in your household? Yeah, that's an excellent question and definitely something that's very important for Detroiters to know. Um, if someone is experiencing symptoms, what you want to do is try to find a room or somewhere in the house where that person can be by themselves and that everyone can be on the other side. So for instance, in my house, my family tried to make a little plan while COVID was going on and we decided that if someone does start to feel sick, then what we're going to do is we have one bedroom that my sibling is going to get kicked out of and so that person will stay in that bedroom until their, their, um, all their symptoms subside and they, they don't have any symptoms. Um, I believe it was for three days, but the guidelines are on the CDC website in terms of when can they actually come out. So you want to be sure to allow them as best as you can. I know it's hard, but just to give them some area where people won't be going to them, limit your interaction significantly. Um, and also if they can have their own bathroom, I know, again, that's hard to do, but just making sure that they're completely isolated because you don't want to, uh, to spread that within a household. And if, if there is only one bathroom in the household, how much should you be sanitizing after a person um, who's ill uses it? Yeah, I would say that it's safe to, to sanitize before and after every use of the bathroom. Um, it can linger on services, surfaces, so you want to be sure to use something like bleach water or other disinfecting products to make sure that you're really cleaning off um, everything. And again, the CDC has different ways, uh, different tips and tricks on how to clean, where to clean, um, and whatnot, and what, what products to use as well. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jamada? Yes, um, so thank you so much, Naveen. Uh, you gave us a lot to think about. And we also want to just take a moment to reinforce how important it is that if someone in your home has tested positive, that you do everything you can to quarantine and to make sure that you're sanitizing consistently. Uh, because we've seen the dangers that happen in families and how, in fact, sometimes um, the disease literally rips through a family. So please take that seriously. And please know everyone in our listening audience to stay tuned and keep track of both the CDC, State of Michigan, and also certainly our Detroit Health Department website. So we're going to move forward into our next section. And what we'd like to be able to do is move into education and want to let you know that we know that there are many of you there that are wondering what's going on with Detroit Public Schools, charter schools, what are teachers planning to do this summer? We'll start off with providing you some updates from DPSCD. Normally we would have had the wonderful Crystal Wilson to join us, but unfortunately she's out ill today, but she has provided her information. And I'm gonna take the liberty of trying to read some of that to you. Uh, so first DPSCD wants to let you know, summer school will begin on Monday, July the 13th, 2020. That's Monday, July the 13th. Academic enrichment is being provided for students from kindergarten through to the eighth grade. And that will be offered as an opportunity to uh, participate in daily academic activities in literacy and math. That's for students from kindergarten to the eighth grade. Uh, there's also around courses and grade recovery. Students in the sixth through the 12th grade will be offered an opportunity to make up a course needed for promotion or graduation. So many of you out there that are seniors uh, and you're worried, are you going to graduate? You will have an opportunity to make up courses that's needed for your promotion or graduation. Call your school. High school acceleration. Students in the ninth through the 11th grade will be offered an opportunity to take a virtual course from a limited set of course options through edgenuity that is required for graduation. So if you're a high school student in an accelerated program, contact your school, you will have the opportunity to take some virtual courses to move you forward. Table updates. I should say table, I meant tablet updates. How could we forget the computers that our children need to address the issue of the horrific digital divide that we have in this nation? And we're so pleased that more of our children, both in charters as well as DPSCD, will have access to tablets and laptops. 
DPSCD is making sure that high school students, you are being notified to pick up your tablets in June and July. So high school students, you're picking up your tablets in June and July. Kindergarten through eighth grade students will receive tablets in July. Parents, hope you made note of that. Summer meals, another critical function that schools play, not only to provide socialization and academics, but also food for our children. Beginning July the 1st, DPSCD will move to its summer feeding program, and that's required by the Michigan Department of Education. Under the summer program model, students attending summer school at one of the 23 locations that are available will be fed daily. Daily, they will receive a breakfast, a lunch, and a total of 14 schools will continue to offer grab and go meals to families every Monday through Thursday. So there are schools right now, 14 of them, that have grab and go meals. Those will still be available Monday through Thursday, all the way to August the 20th. And you can find a list of those schools, the schedule and what's available by going to Detroit12.org. That's Detroit12.org website to get more information. So the school reopening plan, in one of our previous town halls, you heard Dr. Vitti speak to that, you heard the charter speak to that. All of the school districts in the city uh, of Detroit and other cities and throughout the state were required to develop a reopening plan. Dr. Vitti has reviewed the reopening plan with the board, board Tuesday, night. Tuesday night. The four That's phase plan was presented to teachers, staff, families and students, and the community last week during a series of engagement sessions. The district will ensure all the district staff are properly trained and are required to return to work with who have a negative COVID test. Schools will also engage families on protocols that would be in place as we approach the return to fall. And as we all know, a reopen will largely be based upon the current status of the pandemic. The district will be prepared if there is another outbreak. Know that they are planning. All students will have a tablet with, that is wireless uh, with wireless access thanks to the Connected Futures Partnership. So that's a lot of information. We'll make sure that you have uh, access to that if your child is in DPSCD. At this point, what we'd like to do is make sure that we move forward to hear from teachers and who better to get that insight from than Dave Hecker, who is the president of the American Federation of Teachers. Welcome, Dave. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, thank you for that report. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for asking me to join uh, this, uh, this Zoom meeting. I've been, um, uh, I've been honored to be appointed by the governor to the Return to School Advisory Council, which will be advising the governor on uh, ideas about that she would want to consider concerning the opening of schools, the reopening of schools throughout the state. Uh, just so you know, there are a couple of uh, uh, different groups of people who are uh, um, who are working on it. There's the Return to School Advisory Council. The Department of Education, the Michigan Department of Education has also had three task forces going. One dealing with urban, which I sit on, one dealing with rural, one dealing with suburban districts. Those uh, task forces are advising Superintendent Rice. Because Superintendent Rice sits on an internal task force about reopening schools, along with other people who are in leadership of the state. So the, the governor will take a look at the recommendations from the Return to School Advisory Council, and we'll take a look at the uh, recommendations of the task force, which I think will probably end up being somewhat similar. And before she makes uh, her decision, which as she announced yesterday at a press conference, she wants to have a series of recommendations uh, coming out uh, on, uh, on June 30th or, or thereabouts. If you saw her press conference or read about her press conference yesterday, uh, uh, the talk of the advisory council is to follow her general, the governor's safe start plan. You know, she's divided the state into six districts uh, based on the prevalence of COVID-19 uh, and how that's being 
dealt with in various parts of the in in uh, in various parts of the state. Uh, she did put out yesterday that for uh, those places in phases four, five, and six, those are where there are there's there's less of a crisis on COVID, a crisis, but much less of a crisis. That uh, she will undoubtedly authorize in-person learning. And then the council is still going through uh, everything we think needs to be in place in phases four, five, and six, but also the parts of the state that are in one, two, and three, and what needs to be in place for those schools to either open, or when can those schools open, what needs to be in place for those schools to be open. As you know, there are an untold number of uh, issues to tackle with this, just uh, a myriad of issues. Everyone like you are, are weighing the same things. Health has to be priority, but uh, educating our kids also a top priority. Um, uh, teachers and staff have done a tremendous job over the last three months, but everyone will say, it is not the same as a teacher in the classroom uh, interacting with the kids. So um, we're trying to, the advisory council is trying to strike that balance. And uh, we meet once a week uh, and work, work through this. So uh, that's where we are. And again, uh, the governor's edict to us was get me some recommendations uh, by the end of the month so I could be out there because districts obviously need to know. Many districts, as we just heard from DPSCD, have put out or are working on, uh, are working on return to school plans. So uh, thank you. Thank you for the time. I hope that update was uh, somewhat useful and happy to come back with further updates as this, uh, as this work proceeds. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, in fact, and it's very positive to know that leadership in our state is listening to voices from the trenches and making sure community voices are part of this as well. And that it's a coordinated effort um, it is refreshing and that's one of our assets uh, here in Michigan. Uh, but also as we talk about our schools, we wanna make sure that we also hear from our charters. And so in that tone, we're so pleased to welcome back Ralph Bland. Ralph is the CEO of New Paradigm for Education. Welcome Ralph. Thanks for having me back, uh, Jamela. Yeah, and, you're quite. Uh, good afternoon, David. How are you? Good, Ralph. How are you doing? Good, good, good. So, uh, Jametta, uh David made uh, actually he made some great uh, comments. Uh, it is a lot of a lot of committees going on looking at what uh, looking at reopening and how reopening should look. Uh, I also sit on a couple of national uh, committees and task force around reopening and trying to get some insight uh, on the national level and seeing how things are going on the national level. But also, uh, I would like to talk about uh, just a couple of things dealing with technology, but also summer school and a couple of other points. Uh, technology, as far as uh, when COVID hit, and we were able to get about 90% of our kids online. Uh, we don't have a one-to-one -one network yet with uh, computers. We hope to have that soon. But we were able to supply them with hotspots and also give parents computers if they needed computers. Um, and moving forward, I think that's going to be important that uh, we leverage, we're able to leverage on a statewide level how to increase uh, broadband access to schools, all schools, and also seeing how we can uh, outfit enough families with technology so they could uh, end up getting a quality, some type of quality of, of education and their children could be successful. I think that's gonna be important for all schools, period, in the state of Michigan. Uh, moving over towards summer school, we're gonna have a three-tiered approach, summer school, uh, looking at synchronous and asynchronous uh, learning, learning at all, all one time and also independent learning. Uh, it's going to be broken down into three tiers. Uh, tier three would be four days where students in that category 
I have a lot of learning to catch up on and basically wasn't where we wanted them to be. And that's gonna be a theme base and those students will also participate in projects. Uh, tier two would be those students that are close to meeting expectations and standards and will probably be online two to three days a week with a combination of projects and also uh, reading a lot of novels. And uh, tier one, would be students that meet or exceed those expectations and would do more of a hybrid model uh, with synchronous and asynchronous, uh, doing some independent learning, uh, problem solving, and also uh, it would be heavy novel base. So, and I think that's important. And what I would like to talk about in addition to that is that parents, when you we look at what's critical right now for parents. I think David made a good point that health is number one. And we have to look at health of uh, students and staff, and uh, that's gonna be very critical. But also if any learning is offered by any uh, school district, charter, private or Catholic, I think it's very vital that those parents take their schools up on that learning so because it's gonna be some additional loss because of the COVID. And I think that's important that parents make sure that their children are in a quality program uh, throughout the summer to make sure they can catch up on, any, excuse me, any learning loss that they have may have. Uh, and I think that's gonna be critical. So I think parents definitely have to uh, keep up with that. Uh, and then also, any parents out there, you wanna make sure that you are contacting your school or your school district to make sure that you can get a little input on their plan uh, as far as the reopening plan and you can find out what the reopening plan is about. I think that's gonna be critical. And also it's gonna be critical that uh, you look at the communication behind the plan, the safety and the training because it's gonna be important because I see that we're gonna to have to also train in addition to our staff, uh, students and parents are gonna to have to go through some training also by uh, the schools and other organizations so they can be uh, very abreast to what's going on, especially with the COVID and learning how to uh, making sure that they're, they're up on the cleanliness and being able to also communicate to their, that to their child, uh, that's gonna be critical. So Ralph, thank you for uh, sharing not only the work that you're doing at New Paradigm for your students, but it obviously just affects all of us. Um, and I wanna just uh, ask two questions. Both of you talked about it. Without specifying it, we know about the digital divide. So one of the things I'd like to share with you um, in the, I'm so privileged to be able to be part of the governor's uh, racial equity task force. And one of the things that we're talking about is how important telehealth is in order for families to get information with their physicians, pediatricians, et cetera. But guess what? In health, they have the exact same problem as we do in education, which is there are not enough devices that are available for everyone in our community. So I hope that you will join us as we start talking about uh, with Ed Trust Midwest and others saying, we need a campaign that says internet for all. And if we can create that as a campaign, then that will help resolve issues, not only for health, not only for education and social services, but also for the jobs that people need to use the internet for. Uh, so we have a, a huge d debate and divide that we need to overcome. Could you, before both of you go off, uh, just for a moment, talk about in what ways do you think that, the, that food for the summer is how are you addressing that? Because we know so many of our families uh, go to schools to be able to get the nutrition that their children need. Ralph. Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> kind of guy I am, Ralph. <laughs> so over the summer, uh, we're definitely uh, continuing our food distribution uh, at every school. And that'll be on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We are also able to uh, uh, create a partnership with Gleaners, and we will have food. We will have food distribution on Wednesdays, 
certain Wednesdays of the month. But that, and one thing I want to say, the food distribution is not only for the schools that we service, it's for the whole community. Mm -hmm. And we are not turning down anybody in the community if they would like to come by on those days and pick up food. And we think that's very critical, just being a part of the community and looking at the broad sense of uh, what needs are with people and the community. So that's gonna be very critical. And, uh, and I just wanted to mention that. In addition, we're also working with the community and we've been handing out uh, masks, uh, gloves, because uh, sometimes I think we just take for granted that people ought to have and be able to uh, obtain these items when they can't. So we also are handing out gloves and masks at all our food distributions every time uh, families come to pick up food. And, uh, and, if, and that's anybody in the community that needs any mask or gloves. Uh, if they wanna get in contact with me after this, I can make sure and help them out and we can make sure that- Wonderful. Um, and just like I had a few questions, I'm really pleased because I believe we have quite a few questions from our audience, Christine. We do, Jametta. Um, please continue to post your questions in the chat. Also, there's a survey in the chat right now. Uh, if you fill it out, you'll be entered to win a $25 gift card. Okay, so here we go. Where can parents get this information um, that was given from DPSCD? Um, is it available in Spanish and in Arabic? And I wanted to just announce that, that it, we will translate what Jametta read, and then we will ask DPSCD if they've got this information in written form um, and if it's translated. So we'll translate what Jametta read today, both in Spanish and in Arabic, and we'll make sure it gets uh, back onto Facebook so that you can access mm -hmm. it there. Um, our schools, so this could be for Dave or and um, Ralph, uh, are schools going to have to um, have have access to tests for students? Yeah, are schools going to have access? Testing. So it's a testing question and, and standardized COVID testing. testing. Yeah. Testing. Will there be, not standardized, will there be access to COVID testing? Oh, oh COVID. COVID. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, there will need to be. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there will, there will need to be, uh, districts will need to be able to, uh, figure out how to do that. Um, and, and is that what's going on in new paradigm also, uh, Ralph? I was going to say, I, I can't agree with David more that, uh, I think it's going to have to be a must for schools. Uh, especially if we're talking about students coming back in person for learning. Uh, I couldn't agree with David more. So I think this question is really rooted in, in what happened when we had to quickly go into um, a, a shelter in place order. Um, and as you both know, uh, schools, you know, what, what was being done virtually wasn't necessarily counted. So this question is, will virtual school be counted for grades going into the fall? So what, you know, in, in the governor's uh, many executive orders, you know, there are, there are a number dealing with education in which a number of uh, state requirements were waived. Uh, you know, attendance, seat time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and those, in my mind, uh, those times, you know, speak for myself and, you know, not return to school council because uh, uh, all that's still being discussed. But in, in my mind, we would strongly advocate that an awful lot of the things that Governor Whitmer issued an executive order on that need to be waived will need to be waived uh, the same this year as well. Uh, we don't think there should be any standardized testing this year. Uh, uh, that impacts how those tests are, how those tests are used, right? Uh, we think the attend 75% attendance uh, needs to be waived. W one thing I'm, I'm uh, I guess I should apologize for throwing out a, uh, a difficult question and then needing to leave in a few minutes.
But, uh, you know, there are two things everyone needs to grapple with. One that we're all working on, uh, everyone on this, on this call and on these committees so hard. Yeah. What is the right way to do it, right? right? But then we also have to deal with what's reality, right? Let's say the right way to do it is everyone wears a mask, okay? Well, then what happens when you know a lot of people are not going to wear a mask, right? And that, you know, that's just one of the questions, but we have to look at all these issues as to what is the best practice recommendation? Absolutely, that's what we're working on, but also how do we deal with reality when that hits us uh, when school starts again? Thank you, David. Ralph, do you have anything to add related to the, to the virtual school being counted for grades? Uh, I think David makes a good point again. Uh, what's reality, because uh, those are difficult decisions. And going through this the first time for the entire state, uh, even the governor, those are going to be have to, they, those are going to be difficult decisions. Now, should they be counted? Well, previously, uh, the, the governor uh, and Dr. Rice issued a, either a pass or, or, or fail. So it, I'm thinking that it'll probably be along that line again, because it's just so it's just so difficult when you're not in front of a real teacher, and if you don't have the resources that you need, and the teacher doesn't have the resources that they would like to to give to the student, uh, it's just actually it's unfair, mm -hmm. and so we're just dealing with like going back to David's point, what's reality? Thank you, Ralph. David, before you have to jump off, um, will teachers who are high risk have the option to remain at home and teach online? Uh, again, let me just speak for myself and, and not just myself, but AFT Michigan. Absolutely. Uh, we, we would strongly advocate that if you are at risk because of a health issue or you're my age, uh, you need to be given options if you're in a more high risk uh, category. Great. So I'm gonna, there's three more questions, maybe four, cause I have the little dot, dot, dots on my phone. Um, so what about, so there, there's questions about water, access to water. What about air conditioning in schools? Cause there's been, there's been some, um, some, uh, recommendations that you have good ventilation in your public buildings um, and, and air conditioning and and classrooms when people have to have masks on all day long like how will how will that work so there's um, you know at, at AFT Michigan our, our buildings downtown as people probably know Jefferson and Shane we had company we use come out and he said whatever you got to do up there on the roof uh uh to improve the system the air quality please please do uh the uh and you know ideally in every school building that gets done but there's a you probably spoke about this before i got on but you know another very big issue out there is who the heck is paying for all this you know, uh, deal, uh, education during COVID is more expensive than education is uh, without COVID. Education is already totally underfunded pre pre COVID. You know, we're fighting for federal money through the Heroes Act, where we're going to fight for as much you know we could get from the state. Uh, but we know the the economic situation. Uh, there's best practices. There's the reality of people following best practices. But then there's also who's going to pay for all this stuff. So def definitely, Christine, I just want to comment on that. Yeah, uh, go ahead. And, I, and, and I couldn't say that better, that schools are going to be and, and districts are going to be in a situation where money is not going to come from uh, falling out of trees. And, it, and it, we're talking about new money. Uh, and so that's going to be very critical. And schools are going to have to make physical improvements within the school. Uh, in addition to uh, improvements on, on materials, supplies, continuous materials and supplies, uh, getting ready for uh, keeping people safe regarding COVID-19. And, and again, that money has to come from somewhere. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
It sounds like we need to do some advocating. Um, will schools be taking? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> will schools be taking more precautions, such as disinfecting uh, equipment, playgrounds, computers, lockers, desks, those kinds of things? So I guess David, are, are is the is the um, the back to school coalition? I know that I did not say that right, and I apologize for that. Are they thinking about that? And then Ralph, in in your plan for New Paradigm. What does that look like? You got the name 95% right. Thank you. Sorry. And, <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's being looked at. Okay. And Raul? Uh, definitely. Definitely. And I think that you're going to see even more schools and school districts look at days where students or staff uh, don't even come in, that they just need to do some real deep cleaning in the building in addition to deep cleaning every day. And disinfect. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's I have two more questions. Lunchtime is already limited. How are safety precautions going to affect this? Will schools try to have better food choices so that children are eating healthier? Ralph? Uh, I would say yes, definitely, because uh, we want to make sure that children. Uh, students are getting the proper nutrition uh, daily. Um, and with that, I think that uh, we'll have to look at how recess is done differently for students because students are going to need to get outside uh, and it's going to be better for them outside than staying in a school building all day. So definitely, I know schools will be working on that type of protocol and I'll go back to the safety training and communication and that's going to be uh, very important, especially for the the little babies in uh, K through three that always like to bump and run and push and fall. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be very critical in that age group. Yeah, R R Ralph is right on target. Um, you know, obviously when you're reading, you're not going to have your mask on and, you know, the six feet apart is even more important. Uh, lunch is already staggered. Uh, is it going to have to be staggered more? Uh, I think, uh, there are going to be parts of schools, auditoriums, perhaps gymnasiums mm -hmm. that are repurposed so that we have a large area where people can uh, uh, be, be six feet apart. So the, the best way to deal with, uh, with lunch. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask the last question for you guys, but I'm gonna say, uh, there's a question that came in that I just wanna acknowledge how, what the question is, but um, this is really for, uh, DPSCD, I believe. So how is the district going to ensure that their buildings are stocked with hand soap, paper towel, and sanitizing the bathrooms and classrooms? I know there are many parents who are who were absent prior, prior to COVID due to lack of hand soap for the children. So I, I think that's a, a DPSCD question, and I want to tell the person that asked it that we will make sure that we get that out to DPSCD so that they can answer that question. Um, but the last question is, will there be distant learning for parents um, wishing for their children to stay home until next year? So as you all know, many parents are worried. Uh, some don't wanna send their children to school until there's, there's a vaccine. Um, will distant learning be an option for those parents? And for other reasons, I'm just using that as an example. So that, you know, that, 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 that's being discussed. You know, again, as I said before, there are just a million questions and there's really no right answer. There's the best educated answer we could get. Yeah. Uh, no one is really wrong with their opinion. Uh, the, um, cause how do you, uh, the answer I think is going to have to be yes. Right. If you don't want to, uh, if you want, if you want every, if every child's supposed to wear a mask, and the reality is every child is not, and you don't want to send your kid to school because the other kids aren't wearing masks, which is what counts for your kid, right? Not that your child's wearing the mask as far as your child's health goes. That, th there has to be an option. How, how do you do that when you have a teacher teaching, you know, his or her class, uh, and then they have to do the same thing over again? online, right? I mean, it can't work like that. We certainly don't have the equipment to do the ideal, which is every in-person class is also online at the same time, right? 
So, but but I I do think there needs to be there needs to be that option. Uh, I do agree. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I do agree that uh, that has to be an option because, uh, of course, everybody's not going to wear a mask. And then, of course, that brings up another point. Is every teacher going to have an extra 10 or 20 masks? So when this person doesn't come to school and say, oh, my mask was dirty, uh, I lost it, uh, is the, would a teacher be able just to pull a mask out her closet and say, I have a mask for you today? So, I mean, we have to think about every turn when we talk about the safety of, uh, of children. And then even going back to the question, I think it's gonna be vital that, that that option is offered at schools for parents that I don't feel comfortable right now because uh, it's not a vaccine. Thank you so much, Ralph and David. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you being on today and, and talking all these questions through and, um, and giving us great information. So thank you. Jamada? Thank, thank you. Thanks for thank having you. us. Thank yes. You. Thank you, Christine, Ralph, and David. Um, and in particular, also, you brought up two points that our audience needs to know are action points. Um, we know that resources are coming to our state. And we know that both our legislature as well as Governor Whitmer have decisions to make about how those funds are going to be utilized. And you're hearing consistently uh, organizations, specifically educational institutions, are going to have huge new costs. So how, in fact, could they ever handle the cuts that are being discussed? We know with our health community how critical that is. So our voices need to be heard in terms of advocating to make sure that we have appropriate and equitable resources that are given to our communities that are already at risk and to make sure that our kids are safe and healthy and continuing to learn. And, and thank you for our educators. But as we talk about continuing to learn, uh, we're going to try to come back on this issue of what they used to call summer slide, the loss of learning when children are out of school over the summer. Well, we've got something new and that's called the COVID slide. Our children have been out of school already for three months. And there are people working very hard across the city of Detroit to see how can we bring together quality programs and coordinate our effort for the summer. So really pleased to uh, have join us, Tony Adair, uh, Tanya Adair. Tanya is the Chief Impact Officer for United Way and is the lead on a phenomenal effort being made across the city to coordinate around summer programs. Tanya, welcome. I thank you, Jametta. It's so wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you for having me as a part of this conversation. Uh, I want to just talk about how uh, we are really coming together with a collaborative a collaboration with the city of Detroit uh, and Skillman. United Way is really shepherding, coordinating efforts to convene a, a wonderful group of uh, diverse community-led work groups to really kind of develop a comprehensive plan that outlines safe and available options for Detroit children and families uh, during the summer 2020. And like everyone else, safety is our number one priority with everything that is going on. Uh, we wanna make sure our children are safe. We wanna make sure the adults that are working with the children are safe uh, and just overall providing opportunities for parents. Because one of the things that we know and realize is that businesses are reopening, jobs are reopening. And with that, parents have options. And there will be parents who will decide that I'm just not ready for my children to be able to go into a space. But there, we also know that there are parents who just won't have an option. Uh, they won't have any other option. They will need uh, places for young people uh, to go and learn, continue learning uh, and participate in activities. So we wanted to make sure uh, that we're coming together with this wonderful group of, of people to just kind of plan that out and create a one-stop shop for parents to search for those options. The group uh, that is here, we really consist of youth development, early childhood leaders, uh, city staff, funders are a part of this group and, and many other organizations. We wanted to identify, uh, based on priority, we wanted to identify and match current available spaces and programming. Uh, we know that we have some spaces uh, that uh, will be available uh, that are providing services, but there are also 
uh, programs who don't necessarily have a space to go to right now because of shutdowns, because of the, their building may not be ready. So we wanted to play a matching game uh, for those spaces to assure we have options. Uh, we wanted to understand where, the, where there are still unmet needs for families. Uh, those were our number one priorities. And with that, that we broke out into five committees uh, focused on specific priorities. What are those physical spaces available? Uh, what, what are the spaces that are really ready uh, to follow local, state, and federal guidelines for safety purposes? Uh, what are those programs and enrichments that we can match up with spaces? Uh, what are the wraparound and supports and coordination services needed uh, for the families? Uh, those wraparound supports can, can mean a lot of things, but we wanted to make sure that we are connecting the wraparound supports to where the kids will actually uh, be. And so what are the PPE components what, uh, that are needed, the PPE equipment, making sure that providers are equipped with everything that they need to provide a safe space. What are the parent and uh, family outreach efforts? We wanted to make sure all of that was coordinated. And then the reopening policies, tools, and resources, making sure everything, uh, everything is available uh, to assure a successful summer uh, reopening. Uh, we're so grateful for uh, the, the work of YDRC and, and Boys and Girls Club who collaborated to provide a virtual training that, and that is going on now uh, for those programs who are thinking about reopening and providing safety guidelines and tools and resources available uh, to make sure that they have everything that they need to assure the safety of children. We're coordinating a host of resources available for parents and all of what we're doing is really to create that one-stop shop. And on the next slide, you uh, that, that really kind of points out the Detroit Summer Guide 2020, uh, just really a website that's owned by the CEC. Uh, we want the website to be that one-stop shop to help parents uh, find available resources needed uh, to assure the best opportunities for summer learning and activities. With that, there are three components of the website, but I wanna highlight uh, the parent tab. On the parent tab, uh, you will find three entry points. Those entry points will be number one, childcare resources that include information for ages zero to four. Uh, it'll include uh, links to Connect for Care, which focuses on helping parents navigate to find childcare centers near their homes or even near their jobs. Uh, other tools and resources like Great Start to Quality uh, links and Help Me Grow tools are also included on this website. Number two, Discover Your Spark. Discover Your Spark, you, we, it may have been referenced um, for years as the Summer Spark, and I know you've heard about the Summer Spark, but Discover Your Spark really provides available in-person and online programs for youth ages four to 18, uh, not only for the summer, but we're also looking at after-school programs uh, for once, once the fall begins. And then the third component of the entry points, if you're searching for schools uh, for the fall the, in the city of Detroit, there's a component where you can find the available options there uh, that are also included on this website. So it really is a great tool for parents. There are resources uh, and, and opportunities for youth service providers and childcare providers to also be able to go to this site and, and download their information, upload their information uh, so that they, that parents know that they are also available. That's also available through Discover Your Spark, becoming a part of that. Uh, listserv and that network uh, to really take advantage of all of the opportunities that providers are, are provided to help support the, the preparation uh, for opening. And so I've also want to highlight uh, a parent survey uh, that you will also find on the site. And so through the Detroit uh, Parent Network and Hope Starts Here platforms, we want to assure our parent voice is heard and reflected in the program offerings for this summer and for the fall. It's one thing for us to begin putting tools and resources and, and providing programs for everyone, for, and then parents may decide, like, we're not interested in that. So we really wanna hear the parent voice in what, what is the most critical need for parents right now? What are the options that you wanna see available? So it is really important that you, uh, that we are spreading the word about 
gaining that parent voice. Our hope is to really gain at least 1,000 parents from the city of Detroit to complete the survey, which will provide us with information needed to determine if more physical spaces are needed and determine the most pressing needs uh, for those families. One thing we know, if more physical spaces are needed, we, we need to know that from parents right now, because right now you have people who are comfortable with opening, who are already set and are, are putting together the guidelines in place to make sure they're ready to open. But we also have that are some programs that are sitting on the sidelines saying, ah, I'm thinking about it. If there's a need, then call on me. And so we can help get the, them prepared as well. But what we don't want to do is wait and be reactive uh, as we have had to do, we've been forced to do uh, as a part of COVID, but the react, we want to be proactive in helping to get these things in place uh, in advance, not just for the summer, but also uh, for the fall. We're asking everyone's help uh, to just get the message out to parents and, and other providers. You can host an online listening session or simply uh, sending a survey link out to your parent networks. This is still overall a work in progress. And we want you to know that we're working feverishly to make sure that resources are available and we need your support in doing that. But we are here uh, because we know that young people in the city of Detroit and, and everywhere, but particularly in the city of Detroit where we're focused on today to really have the resources that they need to, to make it through the summer successfully, to make sure they have the best options available for them to prevent uh, what we, Jametta just re referenced it, the COVID slide, it has happened. The last few months and kids have been out really having uh, the opportunity to take advantage of learning, opp learning opportunities and resources available uh, is really critical right now. So I thank you for uh, allowing me this space to even talk about the work that's going on uh, with all of the organizations that are involved. And I really appreciate all of the organizations who have stepped up. We know that planning was already taking place uh, and perhaps even in isolation, but that this is a really this has been an opportunity to coordinate all of those efforts together so that we can provide the best resources for parents collaboratively. Uh, uh, Tanya, thank you so much. And it's a joy and a privilege for DPN to be a part of this effort. And we do want to uh, confirm to you that we would love for parents that are in the audience to take the survey. We'll have that information available in our chat and we can send it out to all of you as well. Thank you so much, Tanya. And please go to the websites that have been identified. There are resources where you can get more information. And that means also for childcare, for those of you that are essential workers and not sure where to go. Uh, the effort is there going on right now to make sure we can provide that for you. But also part of summer programming is important for us to hear what some of the providers have been planning. And so we're pleased to have Shona Hayward, who is the Vice President of Programs at Connect Detroit to join us. Shona, welcome. Thank you so much, Janetta. <laughs> and um, I'm glad to be here this afternoon and to share with you what's happening with the Grow Detroit Young Talent Summer Youth Employment Program for young Detroiters ages 14 to 24 in the city of Detroit. So Connect Detroit partners with Detroit Employment Solutions Corporation, our workforce development entity in, in Detroit, and the city of Detroit mayor's office to implement the Grow Detroit Young Talent Program. Um, we set a goal of reaching 8,000 young people for the summer of 2020, and we made the determination that Corona or nothing else was gonna stop us from moving forward with the GDYT program this summer and still striving for that goal of 8,000 young people. So um, if I can, I'm gonna just share, um, share my slides with you, that's okay. As we talk about what we're going to do. Just want to give you an idea of kind of the major shift that we had to make this summer and what things are going to look like for the young people that are going to be a part of the program this summer. So early in January, each year we like to start with a theme for the summer. And in January, we landed on the theme of Ready, Set, Grow. By the time March hit and the pandemic took effect, um, this theme took on a whole new meaning for us and our team as we prepared to shift 
the program and by shift, I really mean reinvent the program to move to a virtual learning experience for our young people instead of the traditional place-based work and project-based experiences that they have. And so the founding, the foundation of making this shift um, for me was really going back to our core values and what we were all about and striving for with the program. And so our core values for the Grody Choice Young Talent Program is really a focus on our young people and their families, a focus on quality, a focus on positive youth development principles and incorporating that along with the um, workforce development strategies, a focus on relationships, um, a core principle and value is teamwork, partnership, and collaboration. We couldn't do this without our partners. And then of course, in light of the pandemic, we really had to elevate the value of safety as we thought about the experiences for our young people. And so with all of these in mind and shifting to a virtual experience for the summer, one of the things that helped us was really grounding ourselves in these values and then thinking and making the decision early on to shift. And by early, <laughs> that was really um, late, May, late April, early May um, to begin to think about how to pivot the entire program towards a virtual experience for the summer. And so in thinking about um, our context, we knew the demands on us for the work we had ahead of us was that we still had to be responsive and not reactive to what was happening. We had to be flexible and nimble because things were shifting and changing and so dynamic in this current context. We knew it was gonna be a challenge and a heavy lift and that we and all of the many partners that it takes to make this happen, we're gonna have to persevere and boy, have we. And then we knew through it all, we're going to have to just stay encouraged ourselves and stay encouraging to one another and the young people and families that we serve. So the overall structure of the program looks relatively like this. Um, how do we get to the 8,000 young people? So Connect Detroit manages about 5,000 of those young people, young people through a network of community-based organizations and partners. And then we have about a thousand that land in our junior police and fire cadet program. Um, DESC manages another 3000 young people through the career pathways internship and the industry led training components of the program. And then we have about 1800 young people that land in kind of what we call our affiliate bucket. And as I mentioned before, and I can't emphasize enough, the really the engine behind all of this are the community partners. Um, this year we're working with probably 80 to 90 community and faith-based organizations across the entire GDYT network, if not more. There's also educational and public entities that are at the table to make this happen. Our private sector employers, and then of course the funding partners that have really stepped up um, to be able to make this all possible. So what is the virtual version of the Grody Choice Young Talent Experience going to entail? The first thing we had to figure out was how do we onboard um, all of the young people that are gonna be a part of the program and shift from what had predominantly been a paper system to an electronic system in light of the social distancing and safety factors we had to factor in. And so in a matter of weeks, we vetted, built, tested and rolled out an electronic enrollment system across the GDYT program. And um, miraculously, it has been working really well. You know, there's minor things along the way, but nothing that we can't overcome to get thousands of young people onboarded for the program this summer and getting them in place and ready to get their learning experience by July 6th when we start the experience for the summer. The other thing we had to figure out was what was the experience going to be this summer since we can't put physically young people at work sites this summer. And so um, on our side for the 5,000 young people that Connect Detroit is gonna manage, we will be using two pieces for the content this summer of the learning experience. One is the virtual job shadow platform and a companion to that will be a social and emotional learning engagement curriculum that we developed in partnership with the Youth Development Resource Center. Actually, um, we contracted with them and they built the curriculum for us. And so I'll talk a little bit more about those 
two pieces in a second so you can get a sense of what young people are gonna experience. But the third critical piece to this was the support that we know our young people are gonna need to be successful in this program and to really triumph over all that's going on in our environment right now. And so we know that entails supports around the technology they're gonna need for the programming, supports around um, the trauma and grief and loss that so many families are experiencing, supports around basic needs that this current pandemic is shifting so many families into food insecurities, unemployment, those kinds of things. And so really thinking about that, and as well as the self-care needs of ourselves as we try to do this, our partners, and the young people and family themselves. So we're thinking about all of those pieces. And the other thing that we did this summer was shift from our traditional wage-based structure to a stipend-based structure this summer. So um, again, on our side for the 5,000 through Connect Detroit, young people will be able to earn a stipend of up to $1,000 based on the achievement of benchmarks throughout the summer. Shona, um, that was a very needed uh, information because we have youth all over the city and parents uh, who've been contacting us to better understand it. Uh, but if I may, because we wanna make sure we have several questions that have built up for you and also the other speakers in this segment. Um, if, so please excuse the interruption. I wanna bring on uh, yes. our next speaker uh, who is Ricardo Marvel from the city of Detroit Recreation Department. What is the city, in fact, planning for our children and youth? And then we'll open up for a Q&A. Ricardo, please, go Good ahead. afternoon, everyone. Um, let, first, let me apologize for you all not being able to see me. Um, I'm having some serious technical difficulties over here. Uh, and Terry and I worked up to the very last minute, and I was uh, finally able to get on, at least by phone. So I apologize for you all not being able to see me. But we hear uh, you fine. Perfect, perfect, I appreciate that. Um, so for the most part, um, first let me talk about um, some of the things that recreation had planned on doing before COVID. Um, typically we would have over 20 sites across the city of Detroit um, for youth to have some, at what we call summer fun centers. Uh, we would have 12 inside DPS CD schools and 11 inside our recreation centers. This summer we were planning to add another 13 sites for a total of well over 30 sites um, for kids to come and have enrichment programming, have fun, receive meals and things of that nature. We were anticipating ha having right around 3,000 kids um, at all of the sites um, across the summer, the, for the total summer. Um, unfortunately, with COVID came across, uh, came across everyone, um, it, it forced us to rethink what we would do this summer. Um, and so what we decided was the rec centers, the mayor decided to close the rec centers for the safety of the entire community. Um, and those rec centers were turned into food distribution sites. Um, to date, we have distributed over 600,000 meals. Um, what we've also decided to do while distributing those meals to help kids to kind of stay up on their academics, we decided to kind of try to provide some type of reading for the kids. We partnered with Kiwanis and we were able to also distribute over 15,000 books to kids across the city. Um, moving forward for this summer, particularly starting um, in July, we're looking to do some virtual programming. Um, we've partnered with uh, Book Nook to provide some tutoring for kids, particularly those kids who we have worked with um, in, our, in the schools. Um, during the fall, those kids who have been a part of the Book Nook program can continue um, that. And this is also a partnership with the Skillman Foundation. They've been supporting us in this work for the past few years, and we're excited to continue to be able to provide some type of tutoring, um, although, it, although be it uh, virtually. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the kids are not only doing something academic, but we also want them to have a little bit of fun. Um, Brad Dick, who is who is the director of the recreation department, wanted to make sure, I should say of GSD, uh, he wanted to make sure that kids were not only getting some academic um, assistance, but they, he wanted to make sure that they also had some fun. And so we partnered with the Detroit Red Wings to, pat, to distribute um, a thousand hockey sticks and balls to kids across the city so that they can spend some time learning about floor hockey um, or learning about field hockey. 
but not only that, they also would have their own program where they would be able to log on to a system and begin to do some STEM programming. And every time they logged on to do the STEM programming, it would take, um, they would make sure that they knew that, hey, we, you have a unique identifier and we're going to make sure that we keep track of how many times you've logged on. And once the program is over, you receive an incentive. Um, so we're working very closely with the Red Wings to do that. We've also partnered with the Detroit Pistons to begin the possibility of distributing basketballs and them doing some virtual basketball camps. Um, and we're hoping to be able to um, go out into some of our parks um, and begin to work with some of the kids, um, making sure that we keep in mind about social distancing and wearing masks and things of that nature. Uh, but we, we're working on some things to be able to be done virtually. Um, at this moment, we're not going to be open any of the rec centers. They will still be available for food distribution, at least until the end of the summer. Um, but for the most part, we'll be working with the kids virtually and possibly doing some things in the parks. Um, I mentioned earlier that we would be that we've distributed over 15,000 books. We're going to try to keep that trend going inside our parks by doing what we're called what we're going to call reading circles in the parks. But we're also going to do something that we call book reading as you walk. Um, and basically what we would do is we would take books, we would take the pages out, and we would put them on signs. And as the kids begin to, to walk through the park, they would read those books. And by the time they get done on that, at the end of the path, they would have been a, um, able to read the entire book. Um, and so we're working on doing a number of different things, making sure that we can do some things safely um, and making sure that the kids understand that, hey, we're still here for you. Uh, we have nearly 3,000 kids that we work with typically over the summer, and we want to make sure that while we cannot reach each and every kid, we do want to make sure that we are offering opportunities for families and kids across the city. Um, the other thing that we're working on, um, and Terry and I talked about this previously, um, is that we're trying to make sure that people understand that right now, while we're not permitting the parks, we are working on finalizing uh, permitting requirements uh, for the parks. So if any organizations are looking to utilize the parks during the summer, um, they can reach out to us. And we are working very closely with our local health department to make sure that we are able to um, allow people to utilize the parks in a safe way. Um, that uh, is not, has not been finalized yet, but we are working to finalize it. Um, and that's it that I have right now for the most part. And again, I apologize for my technical difficulties. Um, I wasn't able to actually uh, give you guys my slides, but I was able to to give you a summary of some of the things that we're working on and what we're looking to do this summer. Uh, Ricardo, thank you. And thank you, uh, Tanya and Shona. Um, one thing I think we've all heard is all of us have to be creative, flexible, and innovative in this timeline. And the best laid plans that we've made, we recognize that COVID may create a third, a fourth, and a fifth plan. So thank you to all of you that are working and all of us working on this. Christine, do we have some questions? We do, um, we have two. Um, will the number of, oh, sorry, will the summer programs have adequate masks and sanitation materials available? So I, Tanya, could you speak to that? And if, if you can't, I, I can chime in. So sure, I can say that uh, United Way has been really a component of helping, helping to get the resources throughout the community with regards to PPE equipment, uh, hand sanitizers and other, and helping kind of coordinate those resources uh, for individuals. And so we will do the same for summer programs. Uh, we've definitely on board uh, to make sure because we, uh, again, safety is the number one priority. Thanks, and I'll just add the YDRC, which is the Youth Development Resource Center, um, the, the workshops that they're hosting for youth program providers is, is laying out safety first. And so program providers are, are creating plans that include sanitation, masks, all, sort, all, the, all the protective gear that we need for young people that will, they're, they're helping to, to have youth programs learn how to shift and, and make sure those happen. So the, the programs are making the plans and we're so lucky that we have United Way that's helping us to, to get access to the actual materials. Um, 
And this was for the health department. I, I don't see that the health department is still on. So the person that sent a, a question about what are the COVID numbers and deaths in Southwest Detroit, we will make sure that we get that, um, that answered for you. Jamata? Yes, thank you, Christine. And we also wanna encourage you, if you go to the City of Detroit Health Department website, you will see a map and you can click onto the map. That map will show you different communities that are experiencing uh, varied levels of COVID. And you in fact will be able to look at the two uh, zip codes that predominantly make up Southwest Detroit. So we wanna encourage you to use those resources. Uh, so we're gonna shift a little bit from having- uh -huh. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. So somebody just asked, how is the city notifying parents about these options? So I, I think that that's for Ricardo. Um, and the, the so. Uh, I'm sorry. Was there, yeah, was this was from a parent who initially signed up for an in-person program and hasn't heard. Mm -hmm. So is the, is the, how will parents know what it is that you all are planning on doing? So we, we are in the process right now of finalizing our website and everything. Uh, but if they can send me an email at marble R, that's M-A-R-B-L-E-R at Detroit, M-I.gov, um, I will make sure that they receive the information. The other side of that, I thought I heard you mention that someone had signed up for an in-person camp and hasn't heard, if that person can email me as well, I will definitely make sure to address that issue. My apologies for that. Great, thank you, Ricardo. We really appreciate that. And then at the beginning of this section, we talked about the Detroit Summer 2020 website. You can go there for, it's a one-stop shop to find out what programs are available that are in person. So remind people to do that. And that, um, and the, um, so yeah, so thanks to Meta. <laughs> yes, certainly. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things that we have been sharing as we've been talking consistently with the coalition is that knowledge is power and our collective action, we are seeing the impact of our power in knowledge consistently. And one of the questions that has come up consistently is that what we know when we talk about the horrific tradition of racism and police brutality is the whole question of what should be the role of police? What is the role that they should have in reference to the community? And to help us to begin to think about alternatives to policing, we're really delighted to have to join us is Jonathan Stiff. Jonathan is with the Alliance for Educational Justice, uh, talking about defunding the police and school safety. Welcome, Jonathan. Welcome, I am so excited to be here and talking with everyone. I do believe I have some slides. There we go. Um, so as we, before, as I get started, I just wanna again, um, just reiterate how excited I am to be able to have this, what is a really courageous um, conversation um, around what safety could possibly look like um, in our schools and even kind of unpack some of what we've been seeing since the Minneapolis school board mm -hmm. decided to end its contract with school policing, uh, followed by Portland and uh, Denver and Columbus. So uh, as we speak, kind of more and more cities, more and more school districts are really looking at the relationship between schools and policing. Uh, and we're really excited to talk about it. Um, I'm a parent, I have uh, there are three adult kids now, but I had them, uh, they, graduated through uh, DC Public Schools. Um, and so again, the, the conversation around safety in our young folk is not one that is kind of removed. Um, it's something that I, you know, I worry about every time uh, one of them, even as old as they are now, still leave out the door. Um, and so for us, the, the campaign and the work really for us started with, uh, has been a long time uh, in the coming. We say a lot of times that the demand to call for police out of schools is not a new call. Um, that if you look and study some of the uh, black high school student organizing that was happening in the 60s, it was a consistent demand of right along with uh, black studies in their schools. And part of, uh, part of our work and part of our um, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, our work has been to really also look at and debunk some of the myths uh, that we get around 
um, why police are in our schools. Oftentimes the, the argument around school shootings is, is thrown up, but if we really examine the history of policing, particularly uh, where they started in Flint, Michigan, there's a strong suggestion that police were in our schools as we fought uh, to integrate schools. And so we understand kind of historically, if we understand kind of the history of policing, uh, evolving out of slave patrols. Uh, and we couple that with the historical fact that most runaways were young people between the ages of 13 and 29. We can easily make the connection that the police have only uh, followed us off the plantation and into the classrooms and that they are not there uh, to bring uh, young people safety. So when we say at the Alliance, when we talk about police free schools, we say that uh, we say it's not just about the, the police person at the door. Um, we say that at this moment, like we want to warn folks that like removing the contract is, is not the end of struggle for education justice. It's really only its beginning. Um, and so for us, uh, the definition of police free schools are schools that um, that we're working to dismantle uh, school policing infrastructure culture and practice, ending school militarization and surveillance, and building a new liberatory education system. And so again, a lot of this stuff is grounded in what we've seen, young people's experience, even uh, going back to Trayvon Martin in 2012, uh, in Ferguson, uh, to see those police departments with military grade weapons and to find out that many of our school districts, uh, school police also were accessing military grade weapons through the federal 1033 program. Um, have all kind of led us to this position um, that police don't belong in our schools. Also, after kind of a series of 20 years of organizing to end the school to prison pipeline, various attempts at trying to reform the relationship between schools and policing through work around uh, memorandums of understanding, better training, um, all those things we've tried and we've continued to see uh, young people brutalized. We continue to see uh, a massive over-reliance on uh, policing, and that has had a negative impact on the quality of education available uh, to our students. Next slide, please. Uh, so for a lot of our work um, with the Alliance uh, and the young people, it's really grounded in this vision of abolition and young people understand abolition and abolitionists as those who seek to end systems of oppression and exploitation. Um, and uh, for so many other uh, kind of abolition as it's been uh, worked through or defined by some folks like Angela Davis and critical resistance, we understand abolition is not only a practical organizing strategy, but also a long-term goal. Uh, and for uh, and it's grounded in kind of young people uh, perspective uh, political traditions. So folks coming out of black organizing, Latino ex uh, communities organizing all have a freedom tradition um, that connects them and has been some of the nexus around um, driving a lot of the changes uh, that we that we see. And so uh, very somewhat to echo Ella Baker, who talked uh, about students in SNCC and saying that this was bigger than a, a hamburger, it was bigger than a sit-in. It for us is uh, it's also that struggle as well. Like we understand young people are struggling for something bigger than a restorative justice circle, bigger than a police-free schools. They're really struggling for the liberation of uh, the human spirit and of the world. Uh, and uh, and so they understand kind of police-free schools as a seed to a police-free world, that if we can, uh, as schools reflect society, we believe that if we can change the reflection of schools, we have a possibility to change society and that the struggle for police-free schools is meant to be a seed towards a society that moves away from uh, the criminal injustice that we have here. Next slide. Um, and so it's not, again, it's a practical organizing strategy. So we offer uh, some ways for folks to think about it. Again, we understand abolition is a, is a long path and uh, you all might just be beginning uh, that path. And so we offer some ways for folks to think about it. Um, so one is just decriminalize, looking at the sets of laws in schools uh, that criminalize students uh, in their classrooms. The second one is deprioritize. How do we make uh, calling the police the last instrument of a last instrument of resort? Um, and like we've seen in so many school districts like Oakland, where 
teachers are calling the cops on black students 6,000 times in a school year, oftentimes for normal routine school behavior that should be handled by a principal or whoever's in charge of school discipline. So how do we make that uh, instrument a last resort? What we see in terms of defund, how do we shift uh, resources that have been used for policing students into the things that they actually need and that we understand will address the conditions that often lead to some of the intercommunal crime um, that we see and even some of the school shootings. How do we make schools these spaces of sanctuary? And that begins with investments in counseling, social worker, uh, youth development. Uh, the fourth one is kind of disarm and demilitarize, right? We don't think teachers should be armed. We don't think janitors should be armed. And we don't think school districts or school police need bazookas and armored trucks and helicopters to protect students. Uh, the third one, the next one is delegitimize. Again, that's just really telling the truth about what's happening. So school districts and parents should know, want to know what the data is, what are police being called for in your schools? What are students being arrested for? Um, and what's happening to them and really getting some, some sense of that. I think part of the challenge we've seen is that policing is so pervasive and it's operated unseen and unscrutinized and that needs to really shift. And then the last one, what we've seen is really just dismantle, right? How do we end the relationship between schools uh, and police departments and for us, usher in kind of a new opportunity to really look at student safety um, from, the young, from the vision of young folk. And we often, uh, next slide, I think I missed that. The, my, is that my last slide? Uh, and so for us, it's about this kind of idea, how do we build power for students to have voice and control over uh, school discipline and being able to solve their own problems, as well as increasing community control of our schools. And again, building towards uh, a liberatory education. And sometimes people are like, what does that mean? And so I'd like to leave y'all with a quote from a young person that we lost in 2012, George Carter III, to an incident of youth uh, violence in New Orleans. Um, and he always talked about, uh, he imagined schools that had mood detectors instead of metal detectors. Mm -hmm. Mood detectors instead of metal detectors. And if you can understand that fundamental vision of what black youth want for safety in their schools, then we have an opportunity to organize together to really bring real safety to our young folk. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you. Uh, you. You hit the nail on the head on many of the issues and certainly we stand with you in this, in this struggle. I'm thinking that we're going to have some question and answer, I am sure. But before doing that, we also wanna continue the conversation. And we're pleased to have Casey uh, Rusciuto to join us. And she's the Director of Communications with the Detroit Justice Center. Casey, welcome. Thank you, and uh, happy Juneteenth Eve to everyone. Uh, so I have some slides that I will present from my computer, if you'll just give me a moment. So what I'm gonna talk about today is what does it mean to defund the police, but more specifically, what that will look like in Detroit. And so I am the communications manager for the Detroit Justice Center. We are a legal nonprofit that seeks to create more equitable and just cities um, all over. So what does it mean to defund the police in Detroit? I just uh, had pulled this image from a news report from last year. Um, so this is directly a report about the narcotics unit, which is being investigated currently for corruption. So I wanna start with a big question. What does it mean to defund the police? So I think as Jonathan so expertly said, uh, defunding is one step in the path towards, the long path towards abolition. And um, one of our sort of fundamental principles at DJC is the idea that Abolition is not simply about removing things, but about what is the world that we're going to build in place of one which values incarceration in these ways. So I pulled this quote directly from the Movement for Black Lives Defund Toolkit to sort of help ground us in thinking about the ways people are talking about defunding the police. Defund police is a demand to cut funding and resources from police departments and other law enforcement and invest in things that actually make our communities safer, 
quality, affordable and accessible housing, universal quality health care, including community based mental health services, income support to stay safe during the pandemic, safe, safe living wage employment, education and youth programming. So one of the biggest questions that comes up when talking about these calls to defund the police is, okay, if we defund the police, what do we do about violent crimes? So I wanted to just raise some statistics that show specifically in Detroit that the Detroit Police Department isn't as effective as it claims to be when it comes to violent crimes. Detroit has one of the lowest rates for solving violent crimes in the country. Between 2010 and 2017, police averaged an arrest rate of 41% in murder investigations. And in that same time span, the arrest for murder rates never went above 60%. So that's a D minus grade <laughs> for those years. Uh, the DPD also inflates its latest murder clearances by counting murders from previous years towards the calendar year in which it was solved. And also only 12% of reported rapes in Detroit result in an arrest by DPD. Mm. And if you look to the right side of the screen on this slide, there's also some sort of disturbing racial statistics about even within that, that not great record, right? White victims have a higher rate of having their cases resolved. Uh, so you can see this is from 2018. The majority of the victims in homicides were black and it's a 40% solve rate. And with 209 white victims, we've got close to 60%. So I also wanted to show this map, which is from the same Washington Post reporting. So this is a map of Detroit and you can see in orange, those are areas where there are low arrest rates and high concentrations of killing. Zones with high concentration of killings and arrest rates are outlined in blue. So if you can see like where this, violence that we are experiencing is taking place is really in the neighborhoods. And a lot of those cases are being unsolved. So if the impetus is put on the idea of solving crimes and, and getting people, violent people out of the community, we're not doing that effectively. So what do the Detroit police spend most of their time doing? So we know from um, Vera's reporting that more than half of all prosecutions in the state of Michigan are for traffic offenses. And since 2012, DPT has uh, operated on the broken windows model of crime control, which prioritizes low level offenses like loitering, trespassing, vandalism, or driving with a cracked tail light. And on an average day, 51% of the people in Wayne County jails are there pre-trial, meaning that they have not yet been convicted of anything. And then there's also the issue of militarization when it comes to DPD. So uh, in more than a dozen military style raids executed between 2013 and 2015, DPD's Operation Restore Order uncovered little evidence of lawbreaking beyond marijuana possession in one such raid, which involved 150 DPD officers, two helicopters and a tank, not a single arrest was made. So with all of that in mind, I wanted to then look at what our city budget looks like. One third of our current city budget is spent on DPD the city is slated to spend another 328.7 million on the police department in 2021, compared to 62.4 million for housing and 41.4 million for health during a continuing pandemic and subsequent economic crisis. And so our spending on the police department far outmatches the infrastructure for things that get at the root causes 
of some of the things that we see as threatening the safety of our communities. So for us, uh, it's imperative that between DPD's track record and the increased need for services for Detroiters, that we reprioritize our city budget and pour our creativity and resources into services that make our communities truly safe. As you can see from this graph, uh, the budget is said to incline. And I just wanted to show you this one last slide that comes out of, at the Detroit Justice Center, we've asked hundreds of Detroiters over the past two years, what would you build instead of a new jail? So Wayne County and Rock Ventures are spending $533 million to build a new jail. And we, these are just some ideas. So this is a breakdown of what we could do for that amount of money. Casey? Yep. This is the hardest thing. We are fascinated with the data that you're providing that typically we would never see. Um, and I wanna let you know now, we would love to be able to have you come back to continue the conversation. Uh, so please forgive me for jumping in. We have one last speaker and then yeah. it's the end of the program. Yeah, I get uh, it. Remarkably. <laughs> So, this was my last slide, so I'm good. <laughs> okay, no, no, thank you so much. And we absolutely need to have these slides because again, knowledge is power and that helps us channel our collective action. And it's important always, we wanna end with the voice of one of our parents, someone who's been doing community organizing for years, and that is Bernita Bradley, who is the director for Outreach for Hope Starts Here. Bernita, take us on out of the program for today. Welcome. Is Bernita with us? Okay, so we want to let you know that we're always looking forward to the voice from Hope Starts Here. Christine. Uh, um, it sounds like Danny is on. Good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry, hi, my reception Danny. is bad. I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Okay, hi, everyone. Danny. Welcome. <laughs> hi, my name, my name is Danny. Yes, I'm a part of with Hope Starts Here. I am a community outreach specialist and uh, Ms. Bradley told me to kind of give some words of encouragement and explain uh, what we do. Uh, and that Hope Starts Here, we uh, ag advocate for parents and children who need essential resources, uh, especially now. And uh, I've been doing like phone calls, reaching out to families and uh, a lot of families that I did get in contact with, they actually needed the resources that we are um, able to provide. So they were taking down numbers, websites and stuff like that. So it was really informative. I did that a couple of days ago. Um, and uh, pretty much as a father from the program, um, like words of encouragement, I know it's a lot of negative, negative like energy going on, but it's really giving uh, me time to bond with my son since I'm off from work and he's out of school and kind of going to detail about what's going on and kind of like how to prepare him for the world because it's kind of like uh, a, a lack of words, but he's not understanding what's going on. He's 15 and it's kind of got him in a frenzy in his mind. Like he's not understanding why everything is happening. So I don't have a lot of answers for him at times. So we sit down and, you know, we research and look at certain things together. So to me, that's like bonding time, which is a positive. And um, also we get out to like, uh, exercise. I've been seeing a lot of fathers with their sons like running, um, maybe just throwing a football, but just getting out with them. So that's like positive encouragement, some things maybe fathers can pick up on. Um, and uh, besides that, uh, we just, I'm trying to make myself available through Hope Starts here to help families because uh, I'm kind of in good shape, uh, thank God, but it's a lot of families who don't have resources for uh, things we take for granted not us per se, but people. And uh, I'm just glad that I can help the families with all of the websites and numbers and, you know, connections to help them because they really need it in these times. So I just wanted to report that from uh, Hope Starts here. And we are definitely doing our diligence to help the community, even though we can't actually physically reach them. Danny, thank you so much uh, and thank Hope Starts Here. And as a dad sharing your experience, uh, we've had wonderful presenters. Christine. 
Thanks, Jametta. Mm -hmm. It's time to wrap up the town hall. We wanna thank all of our panelists and we wanna thank each of you for joining us today. Remember, if your question wasn't answered, we will get the answers and post them next week on onepbs.org and on the DPTV Facebook page. So look for your questions there. Again, we're gonna be here next Thursday and the following Thursday for 4th of July, we're gonna take a bit of a break and maybe do some highlights. So still something for you to look forward to. So we'll see you next week. To sign up for regular updates, fill out the form that's in the chat right now or put your email or phone number in the Facebook chat, or you can text us at 313-288-2082. Again, that number is 313-288-2082. And like always, we have a few asks. First, there is still time to fill out the census. Um, we, Detroit has uh, about a 50% rate of completion, we need 100% of our residents to fill out the census and be counted. It should take about 10 minutes. These 10 minutes will ensure that we have the funds for education, healthcare, food, and emergency services for the next 10 years. Um, this is incredibly serious that we fill this out. We need these dollars more than ever now that our economy is hurting because of COVID. So please please fill out your census, invite your friends to fill out the census. Second, um, please continue to do your work to fight racism every day and show you uh, up to support the Black Lives Matter movement now and ongoing. Uh, and uh, last, uh, my organization, Urban Neighborhood Initiatives, has a bike ride in Southwest Detroit to show solidarity for Black Lives. Meet us at 10 a.m. at 8300 Longworth and uh, join us for the Solidarity Bike Ride. We'd love to see you tomorrow. There is also an event on Saturday from two to four at the Detroit Police Headquarters hosted by Mothering Justice, Detroit Justice Center, BYP 100 and Detroit Disability Power called Kids for Black Lives. They will be Chalking and family, there will be chalking and family activities. And I'm assuming that's sidewalk chalking in addition to other family activities. Before we go, we want you to know that we want to hear from you more specifically about, about the town halls and what you wanna hear about on the town halls. So if you have topics or experts that you want to hear from, please share them in the chat right now, or you can text us at 313 288-2082. We're posting a survey in the chat right now. One last time, fill it out and you'll be entered to win a $25 gift card. This town hall is truly a group, group effort. So before we go, we'd like all of the partners to turn on their cameras. All right, and like always, we wanna remind you to stay healthy, stay powerful, stay strong. Cindy, please say that in Spanish. Manténganse seguros, manténganse saludables, y manténganse felices. Said in Arabic, please. Hafiz ala sahatik, kun thabitan wa matinan, wabqa qawiyan. Ila liqa wa shukran, thank you. Thanks everybody. Everybody have a great weekend. Be blessed. Take care. Stay strong.